All right, um, let's resume the lecture for the, the, the hardcore people. So I will now describe the um, software for calculating epigenetic age. And one thing you can do is you can go to this um, web page, this link, or just do a Google search, such as DNA methylation age software. The top hit will perhaps be this page. And the page contains various information. Um, the item number two is this um, a link to this methylation age calculator. Now, further down in that, on that web page, there are also R scripts, you know. So, just to tell you, some parts of the software are available as R scripts. In particular, as estimating methylation age is fully available. However, there are other parts of the software that are in a form that I don't want to release yet for two reasons. One is they're strictly under development. For example, I have 20 measures of age acceleration and many of them should never be used, you know. And so I don't want to release software I'm not proud of. But the other part is it's also not yet published, you know. So, so some aspects are not yet published, but I already want people to benefit from this, this, the software. And so this unpublished software is then certainly available by using this server, you know. So you upload your data, you get some results. All right. So when you click on the button for the online um, age acceleration measure, you come to this web page. And there will be an upload form. You have to register your um, name. And the reason is because um, our um, computational administrators told me that they want to prevent um, malicious software and so on. So you need to um, give your name, some, your organization. Just give us a little bit of detail so that we know that you, uh, you are a real human being, you know. Uh, you, uh, re come up with a strange name, I really don't care, you know. Just, <laughs> just make it semi-realistic. And then, um, and you need an email address. Because what will happen is that the results of the self software will be emailed to you. All right. Now, what is the mandatory input? The mandatory input is really um, a fundamentally a comma delimited file, what is known as a CSV file, comma separated file, where all the entries correspond to these um, methylation levels. These are sometimes known as beta values. Remember the entries that are between zero and one. So the rows are the CPGs and the columns are the different um, samples, for example, different human subjects. Now, when you have a CSV file that can, in principle, be very large, and therefore we allow you to zip this file, right? You can define dot, you zip it in any of these formats. So over, when you have several hundred samples, I certainly urge you to upload a zipped file so it goes faster. Now, the output you will receive is certainly this measure called DNA methylation age. That's really the predicted age. If you just upload your methylation data, you let literally get this age estimate. But also there's another, um, I output actually lots of different things that allow you to assess the quality of the prediction. Above all, there is a measure called core sample versus gold standard. By now you know I love long names, so what does that mean? That's the correlation of your sample versus my gold standard sample, you know? <laughs> I have a gold standard sample, and if your methylation array doesn't look like my gold standard, then the correlation will be small. This correlation in my worldview should certainly be bigger than, let's say, 0.75 or so. When you upload blood, it should be perhaps bigger than 0.9, you know. You really want, oh, it depends on a bit on the tissue. If you have a strange tissue, then maybe the correlation versus my gold standard is 0.8. But if you have any, um, I would hope, blood, brain, it would be qu quite high. All right. Now, 
so that's what you get when you just upload your methylation data. But let's say you upload more. The more you upload, the more you get. So additionally and optionally, you can upload what is known as a sample annotation file. What is that? Well, for every array that you uploaded, it specifies the chronologic age, the gender, and the tissue. The, notice the exact spelling, because if you upload a file that doesn't follow, that doesn't have a variable H with capital A, you, it will crash the R session or something bad will happen, you know. Female means one for females, zero for males. So if, what happens if you upload um, gender in certain ways? You get predicted gender. Actually, the software also predicts the gender. And why is that valuable? Because people in the lab sometimes align the dots in the wrong way in the 96 well plate. So if the predicted gender doesn't match the true gender, you notice something went terribly wrong. When you up, why would you want to upload age? When you upload age, you get measures of age acceleration, right? In other words, I, all these measures I mentioned, the intrinsic age measures, the extrinsic age measures, you get all of them. And why do I need age? Because I use age as a covariate. Remember, we regress methylation age on chronologic age and we form residuals. Therefore, I need age. So why would you upload tissue? If you have a column that specifies what tissue you have, the software will then automatically predict the tissue. So this is unpublished, but the software literally predicts what tissue your DNA comes from. And that could be valuable to you because maybe you think you are uploading blood samples, but some samples actually look like brain tissue which would again mean a horrible lab error. Some of the extracted DNA that you think it is comes from a different part of the freezer, you know, so. <laughs> but in any event, people use this tool actually to, um, for various applications, you know, they, um, to study fetal development, I've seen it, you know, that you can, whatever. All right, so what is the other output? So remember, I have these measures of age acceleration. The first one, which is the workhorse of our papers, is age acceleration residual. That is the recommended age acceleration measure based on this linear regression model where you regress methylation age on age. And why, do, why is it the recommended measure? Because this measure, by definition, has a correlation of zero with chronologic age. When you form a residual in a regression model, the residual is not correlated with a, the covariate age. <coughs> the second measure, which I don't recommend you use, is simply the difference, methylation age minus age. You know. By the way, um, you may wonder how old I am, epigenetically speaking, and <laughs> I know you're dying inside to ask me that question, but uh, <laughs> It, it turns out I'm five years older than I should be, which is very unflattering. And, uh, <laughs> but um, in any event, coming back to reality, so here's um, the predicted uh, gender is also available and the predicted tissue. So let's come to a very practical concern. So imagine you are fortunate enough to have a large data set of Illumina 450K data. What does large mean? 300 samples, 3,000 samples. You analyze data from a cohort study. Turns out you have a data set that has several gigabytes. It's too large, and it, the uploading will take a while. So therefore, we want to compress it. And there are several strategies. The number one strategy is actually strategy number two is to not upload all 450K data. So remember, the array contains almost half a million markers. Turns out, though, the epigenetic clock only uses 28,000 of these markers. And these markers are specified in a file that you can find on our webpage, which is called dot mini annotation, mini annotation for the CPGs. So, on, so in other words, restrict your CPGs to these 28,000 CPGs. Then, of course, once you have these, the resulting comma-delimited file, 
then you, of course, zip it, you know. And if you do it, you can easily upload 3,000 samples to the software, you know. I want to mention one thing before I forget it. Some people are nervous about uploading their data to a web page for um, reasons of um, propriety and so on. Um, realize that this, the minute you, after the analysis is done, the data get deleted automatically. And why is that? Can you, our server would explode when people from, we, we delete every single data set. And more importantly, I don't even have access to the server. It's handled by another department, you know. I never see your data, they get deleted. And I can give you a written document that assures you that it will be deleted if you need it, you know. So it, it's completely safe, you know. Um, in any event, the next thing we should talk about is normalization and imputation. So on the web page, there's a button which is called normalized data. And as I indicated earlier, this doesn't, um, this normalization is different from anything that's published in that it's not like BMIQ or SWAN. It has a different purpose. It normalizes your data so that they match the training data. So in principle, you should always select it. Why? Because then the age prediction is more accurate. You're slightly more accurate. But why do we even have a button that allows the a person to uncheck it? Because the normalization process is a little bit computationally intensive. So if you upload a data set of 1,000 samples, then it, the normalization will probably take three hours, you know. And so some, um, and so that's fine, right? In principle, you upload your data, you wait for three hours, you get a result, if you have a thousand samples. But there's a little problem. Because sometimes people upload data and they crash the R session. And when you manage to crash the R session, first of all, I applaud you for tricking the software. <laughs> but um, on another hand, you will not get a return. You get no email back. And so I'm, it really um, hurts me to read emails where people say, I've been waiting for two weeks for my results. Where are they, you know? <laughs> Which is amazing how patient people are. But <laughs> so, so what I suggest then is if you have a data set, uncheck normalized data. First upload it. Then what you will get, you will get a, a response within 15 minutes, you know? You get the output. And then you know, well, my data didn't crash R, I'm in business, you know. And if that works, don't use these unnormalized data because they will not be as good as the normalized one. Only then do you upload the data with the normalized option. Then it will take probably a couple of hours, you know. All right. Um, the sample annotation file that you upload, I mean, above all, the rows of the sample annotation file need to exactly correspond to the order of the samples in the methylation data. I mean, it would be, I mean, I've seen people violate that rule. And l let me mention right away, if the predicted age does not correlate to chronologic age, you will probably think, oh, the predictor doesn't work, right? <laughs> But let me mention, it's, prob it's probably not the case. There is the, um, why? Because when I don't observe a correlation between age and predicted age, in, in actually all studies I've ever investigated, it was that the, somebody permuted the order, you know. So if you have blood samples from people with a reasonable age spread, let's say between 40 and 60, and if you don't observe a good correlation between predicted value and true value, something went wrong, probably on your end, you know. Um, age, of course, is specified in numbers of years. Um, prenatal samples get a negative value. So um, how long does it take to get an email after you submitted your data? Again, if you don't select normalized data, you get an email within 15, 20 minutes or you crashed the um, R. Um, so there is this advanced analysis option in blood. There's a tick mark where you can select it. And as I mentioned, if you select it, you will get these 
um, blood cell counts. And let me spend a few minutes on them because they turn out to be very valuable for um, um, various studies. What are plasma blasts? You may have heard the word plasma cell, which is an activated B cells or whatever. Anyway, that's what it is. It's an, so the software estimates the abundance of plasma blasts in your data. There's another output, which is CD8 positive, CD28 negative, CD45 RA negative. So these are cell surface markers that really characterize what is known as exhausted or almost senescent cytotoxic T cells. CD8 naive is na abundance of naive CD8 T cells and naive CD4 T cells. These cells change with age. So for example, as we age, the abundance of naive CD8 T cells diminishes, you know. And even if you don't like my age estimation method or age acceleration makes no sense in your study, these measures could still be very valuable when you have blood data because wouldn't it be nice if you can show that the abundance of naive CD8 T cells relates to your complex trait of interest? Why it would then suggest there's an immune signature, you know? But also you would want to correct for these cell types in an EWOS study, right? You have your, or let's say you do WGCNA, coming back to networks. You apply WGCNA to methylation data, you get your modules, you get your module eigengenes. Suddenly you, you, want to, you want to know, well, do my modules correspond to blood cell types? How would you do it? Well, you correlate the module eigengenes to these measures of blood cell type abundances, right? If you have a module eigengene with a high correlation with CD8 naive, arguably this module measures the abundance of naive CD8 T cells or relates to it in some shape or form. So also apart from the measures I just described, there are these additional cell count measures that were calculated using this Hausmann method that was published in 2012 and um, I incorporated uh, this, his software code for the sake of convenience of the user, you know. Oh, I'm already done, good. <laughs> so before I go there, let me mention, when you have um, a complex trait and you regress it on various covariates, um, I often suggest that you use a multivariate model where you include these uh, seven cell counts as additional covariates, very much as what I had done in this um, study of um, the centenarians, right? Do you remember I, I included several cell counts? Um, here's the slide, sorry. Oh, now that again. Let me see, I need to change the, sorry, duplicate. I hope you will be able to see it. Remember, there was this regression model where I regressed um, methylation age on um, chronologic age, gender, and now you notice all these T cell counts, you know. Why? Because I want to tell um, the reader that offspring status from a centenarian relates to methylation age even after I adjust for differences in cell kind of abundances. That's the point of this exercise. You know. All right, I think that's really the main point of the software. Um, I want to acknowledge the many researchers who um, deposited their data. Today you heard a lot about data repositories, but there are some people who go through the pain of actually uploading their data. Um, I certainly do that religiously because I'm one of the people who benefits greatly from publicly available data. Um, and I want to acknowledge also um, people, Jochen Hampe, um, Jordana Bell, Ricardo Marioni, Tim Spector, and many other people who um, contributed this software. And let me stop here. Um, do you guys have any questions on the software?
Yeah, so when it, the, so the question is the epigenetic clock applies certainly to humans and arguably to chimpanzees. But what about monkeys such as, let's say, verv vervet or macaque, you know, or even mice, you know? So let me start with mice. I submitted an R21 grant twice to develop a clock for mice. Arguably, this would be a very important research project. Sure enough, any project that's really important will not get funded. <laughs> that is um, it's a way, in my opinion, you know. So <laughs> why? Um, please, I, st I will start crying. Let's not start <laughs> over, you know, why? I mean, <laughs> Uh, okay, so anyways, it, it didn't get funded, you know. Somebody will develop an epigenetic clock for mice. I know it will work. We have the preliminary data. It would be very important for dissecting cause and effect relationships, you know. With vervets, I, um, I haven't written a grant yet. Maybe some of you have data, you know, and so. Great, other questions? Yeah. All right. Great, so thank you all. Have a safe trip. It was wonderful meeting all of you. you know, and, um, yeah. Thank you.